Hi there, how are you doing? Uh, in this video, we are basically going to be looking at the elements of a crime. We'll be looking at actus reus and mens rea. We are going to proceed to define each of them. We'll look at the elements that constitute each of those. And of course, we'll also look at the types of actus reus. And in between there in our discussion, we'll discuss a number of cases. And I'll also share with you practical examples to illustrate these very fundamental principles of criminal law. Hello there, my name is Mutiaba Conrad. I'm a lawyer and a private law tutor. And before we start on our class, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel and also ensure that you turn on that notification so that every time videos are released, this is brought to your attention. Also, like the content after watching it in case you find it uh, helpful. Also, share this um, class with your colleagues so that they are also able to benefit. Lastly, for students interested in our private law tutorial sessions, please feel free to reach out to us. We can always give you a hand to ensure that we improve on your grades. Our numbers are down in the description box. So let's jump right into it. And we are going to start by looking at the elements of a crime. Now, it's very important to note from the onset that a crime cannot be said to be uh, committed unless both actus reus and mens rea are present. So both these two elements must be present and they, are, they must be proved um, in court to ensure that a conviction for the commission of a crime is entered. If you fail to prove these two elements, then there cannot be a successful conviction. Of course, the exception being strict liability offenses, and I've already had a class on strict liability offenses on this channel. You can go and look at it. Let's now proceed to look at actus reus. So what does actus reus really mean? In summary, uh, this is an act or omission which the law prohibits, or it's what we also in summary call a guilty act. So this is an unlawful act, and that is the actus reus. This, which is the actus reus, may also include the circumstances in which actually the crime was committed. So you have to look at it holistically. Let's now proceed to look at the types of actus reus. So actus reus can really present itself in a number of types. The first type being what we call action crimes. So the actus reus here for action crimes is simply an act. Just a mere act in itself is sufficient. Here, the consequence for action crimes is actually immaterial. It doesn't matter. A good example is perjury. So the consequences of perjury that do not matter. What really matters is the act of perjury itself. Let's now proceed to look at the second time, uh, the second um, type of actus reus, which is actually known as state of affairs crimes. Now, for state of affairs crimes, here the actus reus consists of circumstances and sometimes consequences, but no acts. They are being, in quotations, rather than doing offenses. So here the mere fact that you are being, rather than doing, is sufficient already to constitute the actus reus. A good example is, for example, a foreigner who has uh, not been given permission to go to a country. So, I'll share with you a case which will help to illustrate this aspect. This case has been criticized in a number of other cases, but it is a good example to illustrate what we mean by this type. Look at the case of R versus Lasona. Now, in this case, a French immigrant was actually brought in the UK and charged for being an alien. So he was actually charged, the actus reus was committed just by the French citizen being in the UK. In itself was enough. The being of something is sufficient. Let's now proceed to look at the last type, and those are what we call result crimes. Now, this is the most common, and it's what you'll be studying and looking at. And basically here, the actus reus is that the accused behavior must produce a particular result. For example, murder, the victim must die. So for result crimes, there cannot be, the actus reus is complete just because um, a particular result has occurred. For example, if it's murder, there cannot be the offense of murder unless, of course, someone has died. So failure to prove death will, of course, uh, not give you a conviction for the offense of murder if you are prosecution. Let's now proceed to look at the elements of actus reus. So for actus reus in itself to be proved or for it to be complete, 
prosecution or the state has actually to prove two fundamental elements to ensure that they have sufficiently proved the whole um, element of actus reus. The first is that the conduct uh, of the accused person must have be, been voluntary. So they have to actually, prosecution has to prove the voluntary aspect. Now, where the conduct, of course, is involuntary, uh, the accused will be acquitted. So you have to show that the actions or the conduct of the accused person was voluntary. It was done willingly. It was within their control. This is very, very important. Where the conduct is involuntary, of course, defenses such as insanity, duress, uh, automatism will be available to the accused person. I'll share with you an interesting case to illustrate the aspect of voluntary conduct and what actually court held in that case. Look at the case of R versus Brandy. It's a case of 2006. Now, in this case, a young man drank heavily and even drank or rather took drugs. And then the young man sat on a low railing on a balcony underlooking a dance floor before he fell off breaking the neck of a dancer who was actually below. The Court of Appeal interestingly held that the accused earlier voluntary act of self-intoxication and sitting on the railing was sufficient to be treated as having caused the injuries. So court went on to analyze and conclude that actually the accused drank willingly or voluntarily and he went on to sit on a railing knowing very well that they were not sober and those two acts of drinking voluntarily and sitting on a railing in itself amounted to a voluntary act and as such court found them liable. Therefore, their argument that they were actually tipsy, they didn't understand what was going on, and that sitting on a railing and tipping over or accidentally falling off did not constitute an accident and that they were still liable because both those two actions were voluntarily. So this goes on to show you how court will apply the aspect of a voluntary act. The other second element of actus reus is what is known as causation. Now, a consequence or result must be proved to have been caused by the accused act or omission. This is really important. Now, if the result or consequence is caused by an intervening act or event which was completely unconnected with the accused act and which could not have been foreseen, of course, the accused will not be liable. But even where there are intervening factors, but the defendant's act remains a substantial cause, he will still be held liable. So here the aspect of causation is very important. Prosecution has to go on and prove that actually uh, the act was the cause of the effect. So the causation to draw that link or the connection is very, very, very important. So the moment the consequences are caused by an entire another act which was not foreseen, then the actus reus would not be complete. For example, let's assume um, Sarah, okay, uh, gives, let's say, poison to Peter, okay? Maybe the poison is put in the tea. So when Peter picks up the cup of tea to take it, um, however, the, when they maybe take a sip as the tea is still in their mouth, uh, Peter actually dies of a heart attack. So Peter falls down and due to a heart attack, he dies. So here what we are trying to, to say is that uh, Sarah or the lady who actually administered the poison in the cup of tea or coffee uh, was not actually, the coffee was not the cause of death, but rather the cause of death was the heart attack. Therefore, uh, causation or causation would not have been approved and therefore the actus reus would not be complete because even though the poison could have actually killed Peter but actually it was not the poison because the poison had not yet taken effect it was actually the heart attack from which Peter suffered and died so in such a situation uh, it will be hard to hold Sarah or the lady liable for poisoning or killing Peter so I think that will can properly illustrate the element of causation. If you're interested to look at case law, I encourage you to go and look at the case of Church versus R. It's a very interesting case. Please go and, and look at it. Uh, actually, the facts were that uh, the man beat up the wife, thinking that the wife was dead. He actually dragged the wife and put uh, 
left the wife on the shores of a lake. So, but the wife was actually simply unconscious. Uh, they had not yet died. Uh, however, uh, the water that, you know, was the rush of water that was sweeping on the oceans actually drowned the wife who was still alive. So when they did uh, a report, the doctors actually discovered that the wife had died of drowning and not of the beatings as actually the husband had thought that the wife was dead. So that case also illustrates very well the aspect of possession. Although in that case, uh, court went on to hold that the infliction, um, or rather the inflicted grievance bodily harm, uh, causing unconsciousness resulted into the death by drowning, therefore it amounted to causation. So court still uh, connected and saying, and court, court still connected the beatings and becoming unconscious to actually the drowning because court held that hadn't this woman been unconsciously beaten, then definitely she wouldn't have been, she wouldn't have drowned. Because the reason why she drowned was because she was unconscious and she was unconscious because she was beaten by the husband into that state where she could not save herself from the drowning. So court still went on to hold um, the gentleman church liable for, for murder. So definitely that goes on to show you the aspect of causation and how um, it will be applied in real life. Let's now proceed, having looked at those two uh, elements of an actus reus, let's now proceed to actually uh, look at uh, the, uh, mens rea which is the other element of a crime. So basically, when we talk of mens rea, by way of definition, this refers to a state of mind of a person committing the crime, okay? Uh, the required mens rea really varies depending on the state of the crime and the type of crime. So mens rea in essence simply means a guilty mind, okay? Or the state of mind at the material time when the crime is actually committed. So, like we said, the mens rea really varies depending on the state of the crime, the type, and the, also the type of crime. But here, what you have to really note are the elements, okay? Let's now proceed to look at the elements of uh, mens rea. And these include the following. One is intention. Now, it's important to note that all these elements must not necessarily be present in each certain crime or a given set of facts. If one of the following is present in itself is sufficient. So the first element is what we call intention. Intention, of course, I'm sure you've heard about this word before. This is the desire to bring about consequence. So if someone has a desire to cause a certain consequence, then it is sufficient in law for us to say that they actually intended or that there is the necessary intention. For example, the intention of bringing about murder is known as malice aforethought. And when you want to prove murder, uh, there are certain ingredients that you must prove. Of course, you prove the death. Uh, you proceed to, to look to, to, to prove that the accused unlawfully caused the death. And that is what constitutes the actus reus. But lastly, when you're proving death, you also have to look at the fact that the accused had the malice of our thought. So the malice of our thought is the state of mind. Okay, You have to show that the accused at that material time intended or they had the intention to cause death now when we are looking at the intention okay in murder cases intention can actually be picked from a number of uh, aspects so when you're looking at intention you study for example the accused's conduct before the commission of the crime okay they may have followed the accused person they may have tried to may, maybe bribe someone okay to go and maybe kill them or hit them Okay? So you look at the conduct of the accused person before the commission of the crime. You also look at the conduct during okay, during the commission of the crime. For example, which part of the body did they target? Did they target the head? That is a delicate part. part. Did they target the chest? That is a delicate part. So you look at the conduct, the areas of target. Okay? If the person targeted those very delicate areas of the body, then definitely... That goes on to show you the intention was to kill such a person, as opposed to, for, uh, to, for example, someone targeting uh, the legs or the lower parts of the body. Okay, there it can uh, be taken that actually they did not have the intention. But where someone targets the very delicate parts, the head, the chest, uh, you know, the upper 
body parts are taken to be delicate, then all that points to intention. Then also you study and analyze, okay, at the actions of the accused person after the committing or the commission of the crime. For example, um, especially in the African context, for people who um, believe in uh, spirits, sometimes you will find that maybe after killing the accused person, uh, after the accused person killing the deceased, they may proceed to go to a shrine to probably try and lock the ghosts so that they are not haunted or the spirits of the deceased person, okay? Uh, some people after killing, they may uh, probably proceed to go and uh, try to clean up themselves, you know, from maybe the soaked clothes that are soaked with blood, among others. So you analyze and evaluate the conduct of the accused person after the commission of, of the crime. Okay. Also, other you may find that an accused person actually after the killing goes back to the scene of crime to try and be sure that actually the deceased uh, actually died. So they go on to check the body to see if indeed they had executed their mission. Others can even, if it was uh, maybe at first the accused, the deceased was shot, he could even go back to the scene of crime and even uh, shoot the body further. So you look at all these aspects and all these aspects looked at together, or one of them will actually constitute what we call uh, the mens rea, okay? Or what, uh, for purposes of murder, we call malice a forethought, a guilty mind, the state of mind at that material time. So all those aspects will actually point to the mens rea. Let's now proceed to look at another element. Um, but, but before we go to another element, we have looked at the mens rea, uh, in murder cases. But how about in theft? What is the mens rea in theft or in offenses of theft? Uh, of course, you know that theft is contrary to section 261 of the Penal Code Act Cap 120. And when you look at the elements of theft, uh, there is uh, the first ingredient, which is asportation. Uh, the second one is the actus reus, the guilty act. Okay. Then lastly, uh, that is the mens rea, which is the third element. And the third element specifically that shows the mens rea is that the accused had a fraudulent intention of permanently depriving it from the owner. Now, you see, for the offense of theft, eh, you have to prove the mens rea. And the mens rea is the intention that the person who stole the property intended okay, to permanently deprive the owner of such property. So the intention okay, in theft is actually the mens rea. Okay, so remember we said that in murder, the intention is what is known as malice of forethought, and we saw, okay, how you can um, uh, analyze and extract those aspects that point to intention. But here for theft, for example, in the offense of theft, you look at the intention of the accused person to permanently deprive, which means to permanently take away the item of pro or property from the owner, that they did not have any intention to bring it back, they intended to take it, and um, become the new owner. So that intention to permanently deprive constitutes the mens rea. Okay, so that is element number one intention. Okay, let's look at a second element of mens rea, and that is what we call knowledge. So if an accused person had the knowledge of what they were doing, or they knew what they were doing, that also points to mens rea. Okay, so did the accused know the circumstances? These are some of the aspects that you evaluate. Did the accused know some of the circumstances in which he was acting? Okay, for example, in receiving stolen property, the mens rea is that the accused had knowledge that the property in issue was stolen. Okay, that the accused received the property is actually the actus reus. But you knowing that the property is stolen under the offense of receiving stolen property in itself is the men's rea, okay? In elopement cases, for example, knowledge of the other person's marital status, for example, is relevant in order to prove the offense, okay? That is for elopement. Although elopement, this is the offense of running away, okay, with someone who is already married. You elope with someone, okay? So that is basically... Uh, goes to illustrate the second element of knowledge. The third element of uh, mens rea is actually what is known as recklessness, being reckless. So every time a crime is committed and there are aspects of recklessness, okay, 
that points to a guilty mind. It points to uh, the mens rea, okay, of the accused person. Take an example, if Peter is driving along Entebbe Road, and they are driving a car at 160 kilometers per hour, on Entebbe Road, you can imagine, which is, a, which is in the middle of a town, it's a very busy street, but they are driving at 160 kilometers. At the same time, they are using one hand, while they are actually chewing a sugar cane and using the other hand to communicate on phone. That is an indication of recklessness. You're driving at an extremely high speed on an extremely busy road, which has so many pedestrians and, and people walking on the walkways, but also at the second time you're using one hand to drive, you're chewing a, a sugar cane, and yet at the same time you're using the other hand to, 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 to communicate on the phone. So that is an indication of recklessness. And recle recklessness is only and can only point to an element of a guilty mind or the mens rea. And of course, this would make an offense complete. For purposes of the test of recklessness, I encourage you to look at uh, the case of R versus G and another. It's a case of 2003. And basically here, the test of recklessness was laid down and court stated that in that a person is reckless in circumstances he is aware of the risk okay if you are in a circumstance and you are aware of the risk to exist and that its result the result of the risk will occur and he knows it's unreasonable to take the risk so you know that the risk will occur you know it's unreasonable for you to take the risk okay and you are aware that the risk is actually available so in such a circumstance, you're taken to have been reckless. And that test was laid down in that case. Please go and look at it. Lastly, let's look at another element of um, uh, mens rea. And that is what we call negligence. Okay. So negligence um, is also another element that actually points to a guilty mind. Or that is uh, also another element of mens rea. So uh, a simple example I can give you is uh, that can demonstrate uh, negligence, assuming that a pilot, uh, when they are, you know, taking off the, the aeroplane, uh, the moment they are taking it off, they actually decide to leave the, their seat and go behind to take a drink. And they are at that vulnerable stage where the aeroplane is taking off, but they leave it and go behind to take a drink, okay? So that is an indication of recklessness. Now, a person is negligent if they fail to take reasonable care and skill or, or to exercise a certain degree of care and skill or foresight as a reasonable mind in his situation would of course proceed to exercise so if you fail to take reasonable care and skill to exercise something okay that a reasonable person would actually have exercised then in law we take it that you have been negligent. Finally, another example of negligence. Let's assume you are at a bar with your colleague who is actually a doctor. So you tell them that actually I have a very big pimple, it's extremely swollen and it's hurting. So your doctor friend tells you that, oh, by the way, I think I can quickly uh, cut off the pimple and everything will be okay. Since I just moved from office, I carried my tools with me. So while you're in a bar taking drinks, he actually chooses to cut off the pimple and uh, maybe you overbleed and maybe because he doesn't have a certain equipment, uh, you overbleed and probably die. So that would actually be an act of negligence because a professional doctor would not carry out a surgical operation in such circumstances which are actually not an emergency in a bar, well knowing very well that they actually don't have all the tools. So they would not have taken reasonable care and skill in the circumstances of a reasonable doctor to carry out an operation in the middle of the bar. So that would actually point to negligence and that would be sufficient to constitute the mens rea of an offense. So basically, those are the elements of um, mens rea. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all for our class. Thank you for listening in. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I encourage you to subscribe. Uh, just click on the subscription button 
and also share and like this video. Also, don't forget to turn on your notifications so that every time videos are released, this is brought to your attention. And then for students encouraged or rather interested in our private law tutorial sessions, I encourage you to contact us. Again, our numbers are down in the description box. You can call us and we can always reach you and help you. Grades in law school really matter and students who uh, have that ex expert um, training and, and help have been proven over time to outperform their colleagues. Law school is not something you can do on your own. You need to have a mentor, you need to have an expert to guide you. So please contact us at any time. We'll be glad to help you. Thank you for listening in. We'll meet in another class. Bye-bye.